Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, September 17th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, public health officials talk COVID in the state. Then a Senate Republican responds to the state economist's new Medicaid report, plus a conversation on vaccine mandates and Mississippi restaurants, and an update on the abortion rights battle headed to the Supreme Court. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Mississippi continues to wrestle with an elevated COVID-19 case count. Dr. Paul Byers, the state epidemiologist, spoke at a press conference on the issue yesterday. We are reporting out an additional 2,594 cases. That's become more of the norm recently, although that is a decrease from some of the numbers that we were seeing in August. We're still seeing high levels of cases, y'all. And if you look at our seven-day moving average, Although it, it, it certainly is encouraging that our overall numbers are coming down, our seven-day average is really at, at the same point as, as our peak was when we were having our winter surge. And so we are still having a lot of cases. During the early months of the pandemic, COVID-19 preyed disproportionately Mississippi's black, on Mississippi's black population. In April of 2020, for instance, more than 55 percent of the state's total COVID cases occurred in black Mississippians. Now that trend has reversed and it's white Mississippians who bear a higher rate of infection. Dr. Thomas Dobbs, the state health officer, says that's not necessarily a surprise. One of the things that it's hard to it's hard to quantify, but it's easier to qualify, is that when we work with different parts of the Mississippi population, leaders within the Black community take COVID extremely seriously. I, I meet with Black faith leaders on almost a weekly basis or attend a, a prayer service, and the precautions taken are really very thoughtful. A lot of Black churches are still on virtual there's still a a, a broad embrace of masks as a protective mechanism. So I think some of it is uh, reflective in the good work that leaders in the black community have done protect their folks. Um, The other thing is, you know, we, the, the, we're, I would say we're kind of under vaccinated in all populations, but from looking at data, Dr. Byers showed me we're a little bit overrepresented in vaccinations among black folks, not by a lot, but by a little bit. Uh, So um, just, I just say kudos to black leadership out there, protecting the people who are in your community and taking COVID seriously. As of Wednesday, slightly under half of all Mississippians have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. Coming up, a Republican lawmaker reacts to the state economist's new Medicaid report. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. On yesterday's show, we heard from Corey Miller, the state economist. He recently published a report that indicates Medicaid expansion in Mississippi wouldn't incur additional expense for the state within the first several years of adoption. Uh, We think the cost to the state between 2022 and 2027 would be around $200 million a year. We think the savings from other areas would be also be around $200 million a year over that period, plus the savings from the uh, increase in the matching rate in the first two years on traditional Medicaid. Chris McDaniel is a Republican state senator who represents part of the Hattiesburg area. He tells Desiree Frazier he isn't convinced by Miller's findings. It's an absurd proposition, and I'll tell you why. The the underlying assumptions of the report depend in some respects on one-time monies. Secondly, it depends on another respect with massive federal expenditures in the Medicaid program. Those expenditures are not 
guaranteed. So even if you assume the numbers are correct, which I would probably dispute once I looked more closely at the report, once you extrapolate these numbers out and factor in the cost, but also the risk involved, it is an expansion that Mississippi simply cannot afford. And frankly, that's not even getting to the under, underlying problems of the Medicaid program. And I've never understood why people would want to expand a program that's been so faulty in its application. The outcomes are poor. The reimbursement rates are poor. Before we even think about expansion, we need to be thinking about reform. And that's not even being discussed. What would be your idea of reforms so that – more of Mississippians could have health care because, as you know, it's an issue in this state. We've got a lot of poverty and people who just cannot afford to pay for it. In everything that we do, we have to try to create upward economic mobility. You can't do that just by spending federal dollars and pretending that's going to be sufficient. It's not. We have to create an economic environment where people can earn enough money, and can find enough high-paying jobs to acquire health care. What we're talking about here with this expansion would basically only allow working, able-bodied adults to come on through the system. That's not the proper direction. If anything, we have to find ways to move these people forward out of the federal system, out of the state system, where they can be self-sufficient. And that's where you're going to find higher incidences or better treatment. You're going to have better outcomes, and you have a better uh, and a more healthy population as the result. So why hasn't the legislature moved in that direction, increased the minimum wage and so forth? I don't think increasing the minimum wage gets there. Again, I think that's a, uh, I think that's a problem when you think about the way the minimum wage is calculated but also the way people enter the workforce and how they negotiate for fair market value. The best way to handle this is not through government intervention. The best way to handle this most of the time is by government releasing the ingenuity and entrepreneurs to achieve greatness, and we do that by reducing taxation. We would do, we would do that by reducing regulations, and yes, by reforming Medicaid from within before expansion. And if we do that, you're going to see more people – be able to afford health care, which is what we're all after. What we do know unequivocally is that the present system isn't working, and it hasn't worked for a generation. And I don't understand why anybody would continue to throw money at it when it simply hasn't been effective. Well, there have been reports that a lot of people have been able to get health care through the ACA, through Medicaid expansion, that would never have had health care coverage. So in the meantime, while those all those things are percolating and being put into place, there are people who are being served. Well, there are also reports of people who were already insured, who dropped off their private insurance to join the government dole, and that's not helpful at all either. The point is we have to change the way Mississippi and the rest of the country views health care. And if we're expecting the federal government to – utilize Medicaid to serve our purposes, and that is, and that should be to get high-performance services and high outcomes. If that's what we're requ- requesting or demanding, then Medicaid's proven it cannot meet those criteria. Why we would expand that doesn't make a lot of sense. We have to learn to think in new ways. This is really simple. For way too long, Mississippi has been beholden to federal expenditures and governmental expenditures to drive our economy. It's no coincidence that our economy is still in shambles. That's why we have to find ways for the private sector to drive the economy. And if we do that and we release entrepreneurs and job creators, people will be able to afford health care. That's the idea. Have you got people on the same page with you that can move this forward? You know, it just depends. I mean, unfortunately, uh, in the legislature and in other places, people normally just follow whatever leadership says. Unfortunately, um, Many of my colleagues um, don't have an interest in uh, some of these more complex issues when they should. So they're they're basically being told, if you will, how to vote or what to do. I think every member of the legislature, every member of state government should be focused on these very important issues because Mississippi doesn't have to settle for last. We don't have to sit here and beg for the federal government to save us from ourselves once again. We can implement reforms. We can change the marketplace. And we can make sure that Mississippians are covered, but we can't do it the same old way 
keep this in mind too. We never got around to the question of what happens after five years. And that was one of the underlying assumptions I think the economist has really dropped the ball on because he wasn't asked to extrapolate, extrapolate more than five years. So consider this. Five years from now, federal debt. Well, grew. he did go out to 10. He did go oh, out to 10. That's, okay, good. Mm-hmm. Let's go out. Let's go to 11 then. Okay, let's go to 11 or 12. Debt grows, both state and federal debt. That creates a ton of uncertainty in the marketplace, and consumer confidence begins to decline. It's a yoke, if you will, a millstone around economic growth. As the debt increases, there's going to be less productivity. That has to be encapsulated in there. He didn't calculate that in. Number two, we're really thinking or hoping that a Congress from years ago who promised a 90-10 match will maintain those promises for the next 10, 15, 20 years? And the answer is they can't. The GAO has said that Medicaid has to be reformed. There's no way they can keep those promises. So let's look at the worst-case scenario. You're 12 years in. You've got a ton of new people on the Medicaid rolls. And then that 90-10 split disappears, and the feds say, well, now it's 50-50. There's no way we can afford that. It will be devastating. Now you've got a system that's in shambles, and it's falling to pieces. We don't have the tax base to support it. And that's the reason when you talk to look at these short-term economic projects, they look great initially, but after you factor in the other uncertainties and factor in the lack of certainty we have with the 90-10 split, it is a gamble we cannot afford to make at this stage. And so that's something I think a lot of people are missing here looking at this project, this report. They'll look at it and they'll say, McDaniel's out of his mind. This works. Uh, it doesn't work. It's not going to work in the long term. We may have five or six or seven years of productivity. It will decline because of the debt, and it's just going to happen. Chris McDaniel is a Republican state senator. Coming up, Mississippi's largest restaurant association is nervous about vaccine mandates. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. President Biden announced plans last week to impose a COVID-19 vaccine mandate on employees of large American companies. The details of that policy aren't yet totally clear, but a vaccine mandate does stand to potentially shake up the U.S. labor economy, especially in places like Mississippi with intense vaccine resistance. Pat Fontaine is executive director of the Mississippi Hospitality and Restaurant Association. He speaks with Desiree Frazier. Certainly, there's a lot of questions that remain to be answered uh, surrounding it. And uh, I guess the biggest, and certainly, you know, uh, everyone's in favor of trying to stop the spread. And that's the intent, you know, of it. Potential ramifications that that raise some concerns. Our labor issue is, is, is awful right now. And requiring either vaccination or a negative test result may drive some potential employees away. So that's that's the concern. On the other hand, if you have folks who are unvaccinated serving food, that's a concern, right? Oh, that's stopping the spread, you know, like I say, but uh, evidently having a mask, you know, offers a a level of protection for both the consumer and the employee. You are expecting some pushback on this then? Uh, You know, it's, um, and from what I've read there, it's going to be, you know, a hundred plus company wide, not per work site. So, you know, it will affect, some of our multi-unit operators, uh, you know, certainly your, your smaller independents uh, have less than 100 employees. But, uh, you know, it's and, – and some uh, some of these members have already implemented similar policies, but not everybody. And so, uh, like I said, the, with the struggle to, to find employees, the concern that it may keep some
some of them for returning. So that's that's the concern. So, yeah, not everybody. Um, there may be some pushback. You're right. How, how has the organizations with the association been able to get workers to buy in to get vaccinated thus far? Well, I tell you what, just the uh, I think just the sheer numbers that we're seeing have you know, convince those that have been holding off or been hesitant in getting vaccinated and, you know, not having to um, to wear a mask while they're at work if they are vaccinated. I think those are a couple of issues that have led led some to, uh, to go ahead and get it. Uh, there's been also many of our members have offered compensation to, to get vaccinated, you know, whether it be I had one member that told me he would offer a hundred dollars if, if you a bonus if you went and got vaccinated. The health department is telling people who are vaccinated or unvaccinated to wear masks. You're right. I mean, it's recommended even if you are vaccinated to wear a mask. And, and there are some some restaurant members that uh, just for you know, the sake of easing customer concern, have all, you know, employees engaging with with customers wear a mask. But uh, there are some that aren't requiring that. So this is a difficult time for your industry. And so ultimately this policy is not going to help very much in your estimation? Well, uh, uh, I wouldn't – anything to help stop the spread, certainly uh, you have to look at it. But for the factors that uh, you'll see outlined, um, not necessarily um, going to be received well by all, you know. Pat Fontaine is executive director of the Mississippi Hospitality and Restaurant Association. Coming up, the Jackson Women's Health Center files a new brief to the Supreme Court. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. The Supreme Court is slated this autumn to start work on a case involving Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban. Earlier this week, a lawyer representing the state's lone abortion clinic filed a brief urging the court to uphold the Roe v. Wade decision. Shannon Brewer is director of the clinic in question, which is known colloquially as the Pink House and formerly as the Jackson Women's Health Organization. She shares with Desiree Frazier the rationale behind the brief. The Supreme Court has taken on a case that I feel is unjust, actually, because, you know, Roe v. Wade has been precedent all of these years, and I feel like they should not have even taken this case. Because if Roe v. Wade is precedent, why are they even taking the case? How are you feeling about the outcome? I know oral arguments are going to be coming up in a month or so. Um, With who we have on on the Supreme Court now, yes, we're definitely concerned about the outcome. And in your mind, what has changed? What's different now? What's different now is we don't have people at the Supreme Court who are following precedent. That's what I feel. And they're not holding up to what they said that they would hold up to. And that's what worries us. And that that worries us for women. They're not being fair. They're not holding up to what they said. They're They're not holding up to Roe v. Wade. Say the U.S. Supreme Court does overturn Roe v. Wade. What options are left for the clinic? If Roe v. Wade is overturned, I don't know what options are left for the facility. But more importantly, we should be concerned of what options are going to be left for women because that's where the the issues are going to come, and nobody's going to want to take blame for that because if Roe v. Wade is overturned, that's not going to make women automatically stop 
trying to have abortions. And that's where the problem is going to come. So before abortion was made legal in this country, what did women do? The reason for it becoming legal is so women could have access to to safe abortions to so that they wouldn't have to do things that were terminal to women in order to have access to abortion care and that's what you, they're that's what they're going back to is women being desperate and women making choices that are not safe that's what you're that's what you're going to be experiencing and even more the women who are going to be carrying these unwanted pregnancies to term we're already at a high risk for infant mortality our infant mortality rate is high it's going to be even higher you have uh, african american women who are they are at high risk for bad health care right now, it's going to be even higher. So will you continue to do abortions until this case is decided? <laughs> we will definitely continue to do abortions until it's decided. We are currently seeing patients uh, as much as we can, as many days as we can. We literally have seen more patients in the last few weeks because of the Texas case, we are seeing a lot of patients from Texas. Our phones are ringing more now because of the Texas case, because of the SB8. And a lot of patients are traveling eight, nine, up to ten hours from Texas coming here. Wow. Because they can't get because they can't get seen in Texas. We have Louisiana patients coming here because some of those facilities have been closed ever since the hurricane. So there's quite a demand. How many days are you open now? We are, well, it differs. Some weeks we're open three days, some weeks up to five days. Well, it's a weird feeling to be up in the air, I would think, not knowing the future. Yeah, it's, um, with the Supreme Court case, a lot of people are asking, they're saying, so if you, because we do uh, procedures up to 16 weeks, people are saying, well, that's, they're they're just trying to take one week away from you guys, and, and, and it's not, too bad if that's what they're doing. It's just one week. But what they're not understanding is the state law here is not 16 weeks. Our facility just goes to 16 weeks. The state law here is actually 20 weeks. They're not taking one week. They're trying to take five weeks. And that's just that's just one step. Even if that's what they do, if it doesn't overturn Roe v. Wade, if they just take that week, supposedly that week, they're not taking one week. They're taking five weeks. Shannon Brewer, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us. You're welcome. Mississippi's Attorney General Lynn Fitch is steadfast in her determination to overturn Roe v. Wade. She says the brief filed by the Jackson Women's Health Organization, quote, offers no solid argument in defense of Roe, and the court should overturn this flawed and hopelessly unworkable precedent. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This is.